Well, thank you very much for having me here. And um, I'm really a little bit under pressure now after two days of such an inspiring and challenging conference. And I think my two other colleagues of this panel feel the same way uh, because we have so many things up now, like <laughs> terms, etc. And um, after the last talk, actually, I, I, I wished I could give another talk because I'm thinking about this large scale question of the Anthropocene and climate imagery and the God's Eye trick, as Donna Haraway calls it, um, leading to top down politics, um, climate services, geoengineering, stewardship of the earth, and panoptism, to bring up some more terms here. But um, I won't go into this, like uh, the slow violence of the carbon chauvinism age. Um, I want to do, present something else here, um, which I'm also doing research on, and want to also introduce media studies as a maybe a important way to look at some of the issues we are discussing here. Um, we could ask what can media studies offer, offer us here, because I'm not, and also my colleagues, we, we are not working on biology, on nature itself, like cl or climate in the terms of issues themselves but about how these things get mediated and how they get researched by means of apparatuses, images, screens, instruments, graphics, measurements. So I might say, I'm a, compared to many others here, I'm a second order researcher. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing research about substances, first order, but I would be interested in how substances are mediated, visualized, sonified, etc. Um, at the same time, when listening to all the talks, I was all the time thinking that uh, media technology um, in, many, in so many ways played a key role, like video, time-lapse, uh, diagrams, photography. Um, and I would like to pose the question, is this just to, communita to, to communicate ideas? <coughs> or maybe um, media themselves are a telos, an end and goal in itself. So let me start. When I was thinking about my contribution to this conference, I wanted to bring in Uxku, because uh, whose writings I have read during the last year quite intensively, and connect them to a few current media practices which use 360 degrees uh, media technology in order to make perceivable animals perception. And what I, my, my leading question will be, what does it mean to perceive animal perception? through media, and what can we gain from this? And I would like to start with this very famous image, which is not medieval, it's from the 19th century. Um, it's called the L'Atmosphère. Um, and it has been used to represent a supposedly medieval cosmology, including the flat earth. Um, and you can see how a traveler puts his head under the edge of the firmament. He is, um, he kneels down and passes his head and shoulders and right arm through the gap, through the gap between the star-studded sky and the earth, discovering a marvelous realm of um, circling clouds and fires and stars and whatever. And um, this idea of sticking your head through the sphere into another sphere and entering another sphere, um, and by this entering new knowledge, gaining new knowledge, I think, um, of course, here it's... Um, telling us a, a lot about the, either the scientific or the mystical quest for knowledge. Um, but this is actually very, um, a very guiding idea for um, many practices today and for Uxkill, who I will talk about in a second. But I would like to start with an observation um, that during the last years we have um, many media um, disciplines who try to, which try to elaborate on this becoming animal, how this is what Deleuze and Guattari, um, how they framed it. So, for example, being a beast by Charles Foster, he's a zoologist, <laughs> and um, he uh, tried to live like a badger, an otter, a fox, a kestrel, a deer, and he lived in a hole in the ground for six weeks, for example, as he writes in his book, and he ate worms to. Um, become an animal, and to, in this case he became a, an otter, I think. Or you also could think about the goat man, um, how I took a holiday from being human, I think he did it only for three days, um, wearing his prosthetic goat-like legs and a crash helmet, just in case. Um, and uh, he lived together with some uh, alpine goats and walking on all fours. Maybe you can see him here with his prosthesis. 
Um, Charles Foster wrote that in his introduction, he says, when we walk into a wood, we share its sensory outputs. Light, color, smell, sound, and so on, with all the other creatures there. But would any of them recognize our description of the wood? Every organism creates a different world in its brain. It lives in that world. We are surrounded by millions of different worlds. Exploring them is a thrilling neuroscientific and literary challenge. And this might, could have been said by Uxkul, actually, also. Um, when the goat man was um, asked about his experience, um, he was asked, did you learn anything about goat behavior? He said, I was trying to forget myself. I wasn't trying to learn about them. And then he was asked, in the moment when you were a goat, what was it like? And he said, it, I guess it was kind of meditative. And then he was asked, do you have new respects for goats now? And he said, they are just as evolved as humans. And I think this brings us to the, the question which I'm um, trying to group my um, contribution around. Like, how can you get to a symmetry in, in uh, relating to species? And how can you have, um, what role does perception and the possibility to change viewpoints, radically change viewpoints, give us here? Um, so, Uxku. Actually, um, I won't go into, into a lot into detail about Ixkü, and I will take the images from his um, later publication, Streifzüge durch die Umwelten von Tieren und Menschen, where he um, asked several people to, um, to uh, yeah, draw images for him in order to make visually perceivable, graspable, what his idea behind this word Umwelt actually is, and I will show you some of these incredible images, I think. Um, and I chose Uxkül because um, maybe he's the one who made thinkable this exploring millions of different worlds, as we just heard, um, in or by using a very Kantian way to um, think about the, the heads and the, the per uh, perception of animals, because every animal has a different apparatus of perception, and therefore they have different worlds in their perception. Um, and I take him as a starting point. I don't think he's, uh, if you take his whole idea, there are a lot of gaps and a lot of problems with um, the Exculian um, way of thinking about perception in a whole, as a whole, but there are some really, um, maybe even artistic challenges um, in, in the book. And he wrote, the, the first time he wrote about this idea of Umwelten, um, it was in 1909, Umwelt und Innenwelt der Tiere, the book was called, and a second edition proves like that many people read it. In 1921 it was published again, and then he continued publishing um, and popularizing his ideas. Um, and I would say that Uxkul's visionary potential, not becoming an animal, but perceiving like an animal, um, might also be seen as a way to, for, as a way to non-human subjectivity. And he introduced the term Umwelt, in, broadly speaking, to um, determine how physical surroundings, Umgebungen, of animals become inner perceptions. So this is um, this idea of the, that there's a physical environment, and but the way organisms perceive these environments are the Umwelten. So this is the inner picture of, or the inner perception of the surrounding. And maybe here, this is a, you can see this is like a little bit like a soap bubble. This is also a metaphor he's using, that every organism has a soap bubble, like this is the, the own perception around the, him or her. And it's very interesting from a media perspective too, to see how he then tries to make images in order to convey and um, this idea of different Umwelten. Um, for example, in, in this later book, he, he shows four images on the... Um, Upper left, you have um, a photograph of a village street. Um, below, you have the village street seen to, through a printing grid. I don't know how you call it. And on the upper right, right, he says this is the the same village street 
seen through the eye of a fly, and then the, the village street seen through the eye of a molluske. I don't know how to translate it, I forgot to translate Mollusk, yes. And I think this is a wonderful program for abstract painting, actually. Um, and, but I was also you know, quite astonished to see how he needs media devices, photography and uh, printing technology, to think about um, animal perception. So I won't go into detail about this here. Um, And then he gives other images in order to um, uh, define the, the difference between the Umwelt and the surrounding. So on the upper left you can see, again I have a language problem, the um, Edel. Thank you. Um, you can see uh, how this animal, uh, how the physical world is, is perceived, this might be the human eye again. It's very much the human eye, which is, he thinks is, is the physical um, perception. And below you can see what the, 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 the animal actually perceives in his world. Like only shadows of the boat and only shadows of the ship, uh, the fish, because they are not so important for, for the, the organism. And on the right side you have the same um, with bees. So there's a um, meadow with flowers and this is the surrounding, the, the Umgebung. And below it's the Umwelt, um, how the bees might perceive this meadow. So it's not so many, it's, a, it's about symmetrical shapes here only. And this goes on. So he has many very um, beautiful images actually to make this difference graspable um, and to, um, to, to differentiate between the surrounding and the Umwelt. And some people also call him an early um, cybernetic, a proto-pioneer of cybernetics. I'm not so sure about it. Um, I think he's more staying in the spherical notion of perception. But he also gave diagrams of the uh, sense world and the affect world and how um, these build a circle uh, for each organism in order to perceive um, the surrounding. And an interesting point for me is also given in this same book, um, because the question is what happens if some organisms are equipped with media devices now? And this is a lot connected to the question of the open, which uh, Agamben and Heidegger were um, working on. And he, again, I think that his son was the one to, um, to do this image, and it's very fascinating and um, impressive, I think. Um, so you can see a tower observatory unscrewing like a spiral into the universe. So you have the little earth down here and this spiral coming out, um, going into the sky. And, but this is not enough. You have, another, have the roof sliding open and a little tiny person sitting inside, I guess it's a man, put it, pulling, uh, putting down his telescope into the sky. And um, what happens now? So what happens with perception? Um, if um, the perceptual apparatus is per equipped with media technology. Um, and he also, I don't know if you can read the quote, it's not so important here maybe, but he gives this example with a telescope, and it's quite a famous example of course for um, the history of making visible different worlds, like the microscope. Um, but he also gives the example of a deep sea researcher discovering new forms of fish never seen by human eyes um, by going down into the deep sea. And, um, and I would like to regard media devices for sensing the environment, such as sensors, satellites, and even statistical maps um, to discover climate change, for example, similar to the Exculian um, concept. So they are devices that alter the boundaries of the perceived Umwelt by equipping the environment with new items um, like planet Uranus, Martian canals, the microbacterium tuberculosis, the ozone hole, and atmospheric CO2 concentrations, which didn't belong to the technically unmediated Umwelt before, but also animal perception. <coughs> and I would like to take this idea of um, the open 
of um, human perception, although um, if you look into animal perception, you will find a lot of examples where animals are equipped with media devices, and this would be another talk or um, artistic practice to find out what happens with animals when they are equipped with media. Um, of course, he didn't think about this at all. So I would like to go to Raul, Raul Hausmann here because I think he's the artist who, one or one of the artists um, who took up, actually he read Uxkühl and it's very interesting. I came across Uxkühl by, by looking into the, the notes of Raul Hausmann uh, who I was doing research on when I was studying, I was studying synesthesia and media practices. And um, I think Uxkühl was very important to the, his new, the Dada, Dada idea of um, expanding the senses. And um, this is why I wanted to bring up this mechanical head here, because you can now think about this telescope also equipping his head, but you might also think about Oculus Rift um, being uh, equipping um, the uh, census apparatus. And just a little footnote here, um, Raul Hausmann was the one to uh, imagine the optophone, um, and I think you need to Maybe this is also something he got from Uxkühl, because if you think about um, animal perception or the senses as being not fixed, um, you can end up by the idea of um, yeah, applying media devices in order to um, unlimiting the senses. And the optophone actually was a device he invented in order to make um, the ears see and the eyes hear. And I think this is just what we need to do um, when we want to perceive like animals. So, what happens if we now um, apply animal perception to this head? And now I would like to go into three examples very shortly and um, then try some conclusions. Um, my first example, um, because I was looking for uh, current media practices where the Uxkulian ideas are being um, used. is Marshmallow Laser Feast, some of you might know um, the group, um, and it's the work in the eyes of the animal from 2015. Um, the first time it was showed uh, at, at the Ant Festival, the Abandoned Normal Devices Festival. I've never been able to visit this festival, but I think it must be amazing. Um, and this is what people were able to do in the forest there. Um, so this, the Marshmallow Laser Feast, they are a group of people and um, a studio that has been experimenting with 360 degree immersive experiences since it was founded in 2011. Um, they focus a lot on VR projects um, and they want to share VR experiences. And this time they said they want to see the forest through the eyes of its inhabitants. And um, we might discuss uh, this project here. They said that the ultimate goal is to create an understanding of how these animals process optical information and so give people a chance to reflect on their own visual perception of the forest. So already we can pose this question, is this about animal perception or about human perception here? Um, so, and another quote I found is, uh, they said, or somebody said who visited this piece, in previous er eras, if you wanted to experience the world through the eyes of an animal, you'd have to be some kind of next level shaman. But now we have virtual reality. <laughs> and I just think that this promise of three, uh, virtual reality technology and 360 degrees is very speaking, and I think we have to think about it a lot. So I will just go through this. And you can, um, it's actually, it's online. Of course, you do not need the forest at all. You can, where, if you have an Oculus Rift, just go to the most ugly place in town and you can be in the forest. Um, but if that, in the first place, they also had these sculptural headsets with the moss smelling, I think. But now it's online and you, can, you do not need it anymore. So they give four creatures, um, the dragonfly, um, the mosquito, the frog, and the owl. I will go back, this was too quick. Um, so you can enter um, the, the VR 
um, cinematic experience by choosing one of these inhabitants of the woods. And they do not make explicit how, uh, if they, I, I didn't find information how much they talk to biologists, zoologists, um, etc., in order to really simulate the perception of these creatures. But um, of course, the outcome is very aesthetical. And um, each animal has very different ways to, uh, the, the images, uh, of course, are very different. And I will just show you the, the movie, and it's one animal after, after the other, so you can maybe decide for yourself if you're an owl or a mosquito at that time. And imagine it to be 3D, it's uh, three-dimensional, of course, I cannot give you this, this experience, experience here. to this promising of, of this 360 degrees um, technology today. If you go to TED conferences talk, you will find a lot of examples uh, where people again tell you that um, actually the, the 360 degre degree uh, perception is a possibility for empathy. It's the empathy technology actually. This is what they say. And uh, it very, it, it's related to shock photography um, and of course, I think we might need to go back to Roland Barthes and Susan Sontag here in order to find out if feeling the pain of others would really lead to a new um, ethics, not only ethology here. But I would like to relate this question also to a, very quickly to another example. And sorry for not being able to go very deep into these examples. Um, but I think it's very important to think about them by reading Uxkul again. So I animal um, is is a, a media uh, is a how to say um, it's a the, the, they use the media technology in order to um, fight for animal equality, and it's very interesting to see that how they how people who fight for animal equality um, use immersive te experiences in order to also um, train you or uh, give you the opportunity to um, have em um, empathically connect to animals. And um, you have to look these things up for yourself again, um, but they are also on YouTube and you can perceive them with um, Oculus Rift, um, etc. So the, the, the idea is that if you go into the slaughterhouse or into these um, big factories of chicken and pigs, etc., um, you will connect in a different way to animals. And it's even called virtual activism. So iAnimal uses this technology in order to um, change people's awareness. And I know it worked in some places, so for some people it works. But if you think about Uxkul again, um, I would like to pose the question, um, what do we learn here? Don't we learn a lot about how people's morals connect to animals? But maybe we do not know about 
uh, what do we know about the animals afterwards? And this is some, a quote I found. You have to experience a slaughterhouse in virtual reality. Now I can officially say I'm a vegetarian and going to do my best to be vegan. And I would like to go on working on this, um, the, con this um, very direct connection between empathy, morals, and um, animal rights, and how this technology is um, getting political by not being Excurian at all, because I think it's not ex ex the Excurian way in order to... Um, it, it's not a an, an perceptual symbiosis, but you stay on the, of course, on the anthropocentric side. Still, there is some strength in it. Germany tries to do this too now. Um, and the last example I would like to give is another artist from the US, Austin Stewart. Um, and he, I came across his uh, artwork in a uh, Hamburg exhibition. Um, um, where is it? The, the name of the exhibition of uh, the Museum of Arts and Crafts in Hamburg had an in interesting exhibition on Food Revolution 5.0. And it's a parody, I think. So now I think we go back to UXQ, and but we um, pervert the concept of virtual reality, or this is what Austin Stewart does, ironically, um, by thinking about chicken in a chicken farm wearing these uh, Oculus Rift, of course they have to be a different um, <laughs> shape. Um, and they're getting these quite poor images here. You can, can of course elaborate now what, what, would an, what would a chicken like to see in this case. But of course um, the idea behind it is a very cynical and parodistic idea. So you would have these livestock um, here and you can place chicken in an even smaller space because they have the impression that they are free. And I think this is a wonderful way to um, use irony here and to, um, because I think irony is a very strong political instrument too for protest and resistance. Um, but also you can learn a lot about um, the, the idea, what it, what it means to do, to think about animal perception here. Um, and I would like to end with do I have some more minutes? I don't know. Um, with some uh, remarks about maybe also making keen or what is happening here. Um, I would think that, um, so we, we can of course now uh, argue, uh, discuss again the questions which are up in this conference, like what is it about decentering humans? Does this technology at all decenter humans? What about non human agency here? Um, or counteracting humanistic positioning. This is what uh, at least these uh, th uh, 360 degree, um, the makers of these movies would claim. But I would think that it's more like a parasite perception, a proxy perception. So we take the, the like parasites, we take over the perception of animals. And um, I think it can be very essential and productive to expand human perception with the help of media technology. Um, this method, of course, may reveal new and other ways of perceiving the world, show other viewpoints and standpoints to oneself. Um, this not only holds true to animal perception, of course, but also to other human perceptions. Um, and changing perspective can be a way of radically opening up a path to empathy. On the other hand, I have mixed feelings about the very ever, the ever intensifying media technology first approach towards nature which many industrialized country people are experiencing and practicing today. And currently it seems necessary or even natural, one could say, to perceive nature through media devices. At this point, I think the art, artworks like also artists um, who are here, Teresa Schubert's Forest Psychology or Maya Smerka's uh, The Wolf Human Dog Continuum, or maybe again Josef Boy's performances such as How to Explain the Pictures to a Dead Hare, might lead to a very different and more intense way to change perspectives. And all these Oculus Rift tools might then only be a very smart way of propaganda in favor of technological progress. Training people to use media technology, so actually it's not the animal to which the users connect, but media technological perception. It's not about becoming animal, but about becoming media. Thank you. Wow.
Thank you. My thoughts is over um, first with the marshmallow feast was um, I, I kind of suspect if you blindfold somebody for an hour and guided them through a forest, they would get more than that. Um, I don't think em empathy is visual. I, I don't think you can make visual empathy. I think e empathy is uh, metabolic. I think it's uh, chemical. I think it, it's actually something that might come through smell, but I don't think it's visual. And this comes from trying to, uh, to working as somebody, a visual artist, as an artist, as a photojournalist, and, and seeing reactions and use of that. Um, but I was wondering, um, you're saying, yeah, yeah, I think you're agreeing with everything's become media, and it's almost becoming spectacle, uh, or is becoming spectacle. And I'm wondering if, if uh, using virtual reality uh, as a kind of empathy game or machine in, these case, in the first two cases, and certainly mocked in the third case, which is maybe more accurate to a response, um, is while it's attempting to make and failing to create an empathy situation, is just creating, uh, you know, let's we'll say uh, another level of the board's idea of the spectacle. Maybe anyone uh, comment? On it? It's kind of a comment that I what is your comment? <laughs> to comment on? Maybe I need a question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would agree to this, although I think empathy can be visual, and it okay. can be, for example, I, well, I just had to really, reading two books, I had two situations which made me really uh, very empathic, it was writing, so there are so many ways to uh, unfold empathy, but still, I think um, the, the, the marshmallow laser feast, there are some really deep problems in this piece, um, it might be aesthetically absolutely fantastic and pleasing, etc., and immersive and uh, all these things, but um, I don't know if it. Uh, what would Henry Thoreau have thought about it? That's a good so question. Which, um, Tarsh, I think, wants to start off with. <laughs> Somebody else has. <laughs> no, 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 please. Um, okay, so I'm curious as to, thank you, it was a really fascinating talk. And um, I'm currently in an exhibition in Dresden which has a work that is made by a, a Berlin crew that is looking at trying to translate the perception of fish in, through VR into a human language and it uh, does it in somewhat similar way to the marshmallow crew I suggest and it is spectacular and it is amazing and I'm just wondering if you could comment on the use of this technology in science and science communication and whether you see it acting differently or is it an empathic talk, attempt or how it might work with book schools ideas? Um, I cannot give you the broad picture here because I didn't look up all the scientific approaches to this. Um, I think it can be a tool for teaching and um, for peda pedagogical um, teaching in order to open up perception and to have this idea of changing viewpoints and this being a very strong um, thing to do in order to change awareness, knowledge, etc., gain knowledge. Um, but the spectacular thing, um, I think this might also, I, I was actually thinking of a computer game when I was reading about these millions of um, animal worlds, uh, No Man's Sky, I don't know if you looked up this game, but it's about um, it's, it's this kaleidoscopic uh, world where you have the little uh, spaceship and you're all al alone, of course, and you can fly from one planet to the other, and each world has a different ecology and a different climate and different animals and different plants in it. And um, this is what connects to, for me to, uh, to this idea of perceiving other worlds. So it's a very basic James Cook way of doing things. And 
this is science, of course, too. It's the fascination of entering new worlds. And, but empathy, and this is something I would like to work on more in the future, and I cannot give you an answer here. Um, when, when does this at all connect to empathy? I'm not sure. Behind Tarsh, there was someone who wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to think a little bit more about like what you said that um, Uxkul didn't think about uh, to, um, to enhance animals with uh, media devices. I mean, I'm not so sure if it's true yet. If you think about um, what he did, um, this um, the guide dogs from the blind, where he used apparatuses to enhance their um, perception. But um, I think you are true uh, in a way that he didn't think it through, and he somehow always dismisses um, this idea. And um, you can also see this in this these pictures from the villages you showed us. Um, and it's very stunning that like the first picture, which is from the point of view of the human, it doesn't say it's from the it's a human through human eyes, but it's uh, it says it's a photography. So it's a picture of the of this medium, and um, the other pictures are like from the mother's eye or from the fly and so on. And um, this leads me to like um, yeah. First of all, I wanted to ask if you could, I don't know, maybe say a little, little bit more what you think about this, why he had to always see, yeah, he uses this, he uses media also with animal, um, is what I think, but then he also had to dismiss the, the idea for a theory. And the second thing would be, I mean, I think that um, he has already um, integrated Heidegger's critique um, here with this photo, because his critique about like how he tries to simulate um, animal perception uh, was like, okay, you can't do this, right? Because we don't share the same word, animals don't have a word. So in, um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit um, on this, um, yeah, because you have somehow shared this idea that um, it's not um, easy to, to paralyze it, but I think you wouldn't do it the Heideggerian way, but another way, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. And yeah, and then also maybe with this picture, this because yeah, I think he, yeah, he somehow tried to integrate Heidegger's critique here and said, okay, no, it's a photography. It's a, it's we don't see um, the human perception. We see the media. So, mm -hmm. what what do you think about this? I I couldn't find any media um, reflection in the book actually, but. Um, he must have discussed the images with somebody, but it's not in the text, I think. Um, and this maybe brings us to, uh, again, this, uh, the role of media devices, like strategies like um, photography, printing, image, making images, making visible things. Um, how, uh, what, would be, what, what would have been another way to show these, this idea by, by means of visuals? Um, so he needs like media devices to do this um, but I'm not sure if you think because he uses photography and the printing grid here this is like um, opposing the critique of Heidegger maybe, maybe I don't no, no this is what Heidegger critiques of course now that he's showing uh, um, <laughs> Sorry. You know, um, no, um, of course, this is a critique. This is a Heideggerian critique that it says, okay, what you see is not the perception of an you will never animal. It. it is what you see is actually a, a device, mm -hmm. a media mm -hmm. device. So this, this would be the Heideggerian critique. And I think how he probably integrates it would be that he doesn't say anymore that you see there a human, the human perception. He says that in the subtitle, it's a photography of a village and mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, perception of a village through a human eye, but and then this would be the thing. Uh, he doesn't uh, do this with the other pictures. There you said it's from a mollusk, it's from a fly. Um, all the they are, yeah, much more as you pointed out. Also, much more. Um, I don't know how to say it. Um, artificial, or um, in a way. Maybe to make it short, because I think we are not in, you know, an Uxkulian specialist workshop. Um, I think that Uxkul 
uh, needs the idea of the God's eye view also, the human God's eye, in order to make these images and to think about a physical world which you can define and which you can see. So the human eye would be the eye which is able to see much more and through science would be able to see a lot of the other worlds too. So there's a, scale, a hierarchy of um, perceptions here. But maybe we can talk, talk about this later on. Because of the time, I'm going to suggest that some of the other questions I'll, I'll bring up in, in the panel. And so, uh, I want to thank you for your <laughs> <laughs>